Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of The Writer's Journey, Mythic Structure for Storytellers and Screenwriters by Christopher Vogler. This is the new revised edition. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This is a non-fiction book. Um, the blurb will put it better than I can, and also I want to refer, refer back to the blurb with some initial thoughts. Dane reads... This book began life as a memo to Hollywood studio executives. It has now become industry-wide required reading. Christopher Vogler believes that filmmakers are heirs to a great storytelling tradition, and the best of them have utilised the principles of myth to create masterful stories which are dramatic, entertaining, and psychologically true. Based on the work of the great mythologist Joseph Campbell, The Writer's Journey is an insider's look at how master storytellers, from Hitchcock to Lucas and Spielberg, have used mythic structure to create powerful stories, which succeed because they tap into the mythological core that exists in us all. This practical writer's guide reveals the secret patterns of mythology, as well as analyses of classic films from past and present, ranging from The Wizard of Oz to Pulp Fiction and Star Wars to Four Weddings and a Funeral. Writers will discover step-by-step -step guidelines for plot structure and creating realistic characters. Innovative exercises also help writers to troubleshoot and improve their own work, empowering the writer's command of storytelling with the ancient wisdom of myth. So my initial thoughts on reading this book are that it would make more sense just to directly read Joseph Campbell. Also, he used the word utilised when he could have said used. It's one of my pet peeves. I hate when people do that. Uh, I'm going to read his bio here as well. Christopher Vogler has evaluated over 6,000 screenplays for major motion picture studios including Walt Disney, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, United Artists, Orion Pictures, The Lad Company, Touchstone Pictures and Hollywood Pictures. A specialist in fairy tales and folklore, he has consulted for Walt Disney's feature film hits The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin and The Lion King. So I recently read Grim Tales by Philip Pullman, um, which solidified the fact that I do not like fairy tales. So right in the introduction he talks about running a movie on a VCR. It's ideal because you can stop to write down the content of each scene while you grasp its meaning in relation to the rest of the story. I mean, VCRs, that for a start tells you how dated this is. I'm sure there's a more updated version knocking around now. And there are a lot of quotes at the start of each chapter, so there's one here from Willa Cather in O Pioneers. There are only two or three human stories, and they go on repeating themselves as fiercely as if they had never happened before. So uh, we've got this, the stages of the hero's journey, so it goes through the ordinary world, call to adventure, refusal of the call, meeting with a mentor, crossing the first threshold, test allies enemies, approach, supreme ordeal, reward, the road back, resurrection, and return with elixir. There's a little diagram of it here as well. And basically this just gives each one of those a chapter, and uh, investigates each of those sort of sections of a story while comparing it to um, popular culture. So he says, here he's talking about the Wizard of Oz, he says, considerable time is spent to establish Dorothy's drab normal life in Kansas before she is blown to the wonder world of Oz. Here the contrast is heightened by shooting the Kansas scenes in stern black and white while the Oz scenes are shot in vibrant Technicolor. Um, which is a very famous sort of thing there, I guess. Um, but it's interesting to me that there was so much time given over to The Wizard of Oz when I'm currently buddy reading the series with Joel Swagman. Although I get the impression Vogler's never read the books, he's only seen the movie. Uh, so he's talking about here as well in, in uh, Eight, The Supreme Ordeal. Um, it's, it's about taking characters to the brink of death. So he says, the designers of amusement park thrill rides know how to use this principle. Roller coasters make their passengers feel as if they're going to die, and there's a great thrill that comes from brushing up against death and surviving it. You're never more alive than when you're looking death in the face. And again, another thing that sort of dates it here is this paragraph. The Star Wars, uh, so this is about resurrection, it goes. The Star Wars films play with this element constantly. All three of the films to date feature a final battle scene in which Luke is almost killed, appears to be dead for a moment, and then miraculously survives. I don't think that's true. Certainly not in the first film, there's no point at which he appears dead. It appears like he might, in all three of those, it appears like he might die. None of those does he appear as though he's actually dead. Uh, and then he talks about action here, um, the, uh, you know, the purpose of heroes and characters. Another heroic function is acting or doing. The hero is usually the most active person in the script. His will and desire is what drives most stories forward. A frequent flaw in screenplays is that the hero is fairly active throughout the story, but at the most critical moment becomes passive and is rescued by the timely arrival of some outside force. At this moment, above all, a hero should be fully active, in control of his own fate. The hero should perform the decisive action of the story, the action that requires taking the most risk or responsibility. Which is a fair comment. Uh, so here again, talking about Star Wars, he says, In Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi clearly manifests the archetype of the mentor through most of the story. However, he acts heroically and temporarily wears the mask of the hero when he sacrifices himself to allow Luke to escape the Death Star. 
Which again, I don't think is really what happened. Like, he didn't, he didn't even need to sacrifice himself. I never really got why he did. It's not like he bought any time for the heroes or anything like that. He was just like, nah mate, I'm, I'm not fighting you anymore. So this is interesting, the origin of the term mentor. Um, so it says, the word mentor comes to us from the Odyssey. A character named Mentor guides the young hero, Telemachus, on his hero's journey. In fact, it's the goddess Athena who helps Telemachus by assuming the form of Mentor. Mentors often speak in the voice of a god or are inspired by divine wisdom. Good teachers and mentors are enthused in the original sense of the word. Enthusiasm is from the Greek on theos, meaning God-inspired, having a god in you, or being in the presence of a god. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. I've read uh, the Odyssey, but I didn't necessarily know that about Mentor. Um, I don't know, I guess I kind of thought of it as like in Shakespeare plays you quite often have a character that's just called Nice or whatever. So I just thought that was what they were doing. I assumed the word predated the Odyssey, but apparently not. And here he refers to uh, Joseph Campbell. Again, I think it would have made more sense, especially for me. Maybe this is better for like new writers and particularly for screenplay writers. But I think in general, I should have just read Joseph Campbell. But anyway, heroes must learn to read the signals of their threshold guardians in the power of myth. Joseph Campbell illustrated this idea beautifully with an example from Japan. Ferocious looking demon statues sometimes guard the entrances to Japanese temples. The first thing you notice is one hand held up like that of a policeman gesturing stop. But when you look more closely you see that the other hand invites you to enter. The message is, those who are put off by outward appearances cannot enter the special world. But those who can see past surface impressions to the inner reality are welcome. I like that. That's cool. So we look at a few of the different sort of character types as well like shapeshifters and shadows. Um, so he refers to Graham Greene, who's one of my favourite authors here, he says, Shadows can also be humanised by making them vulnerable. The novelist Graham Greene masterfully makes his villains real, frail people. He often has the hero on the verge of killing a villain, only to discover the poor fellow has a head cold or is reading a letter from his little daughter. Suddenly the villain is not just a fly to be swatted, but a real human being with weaknesses and emotions. Killing such a figure becomes a true moral choice rather than a thoughtless reflex. All right, then he goes back onto the subject of Star Wars, and I'm convinced this guy has never seen Star Wars. So he says, One of the most impressive shadow figures in movie history, Darth Vader of the Star Wars series, is revealed in Return of the Jedi to be the hero's father. No, he's revealed in The Empire Strikes Back to be the hero's father. It's one of the most famous scenes in cinema history. You should know this if you're a cinema guy. Uh, we get a reference to, the, to Dune, a screenplay by David Lynch based on a novel by Frank Herbert. I'm currently reading The Butlerian Jihad, which is um, one of the later Dune novels written by um, Br uh, Brian Herbert, his son, and um, Kevin J. Anderson. He talks about like disorientation as part of stories. He says, in secret societies, an old rule of initiation is disorientation leads to suggestibility. That's why initiates are often blindfolded and led around in the dark, so they will be more psychologically open to suggestion from the ritual stage by the group. In storytelling, getting the audience a little off base and upsetting their normal perceptions can put them into a receptive mood. They begin to suspend their disbelief and enter more readily into a special world of fantasy. And he talks about making an entrance. I think this is a good point. So he says, every actor likes to make an entrance an important part of building a character's relationship with the audience. Even if a character is written as already on stage when the lights come up, the actor will often make an entrance out of it by how she first impresses an audience with her appearance and behaviour. As writers, we can give our heroes an entrance by thinking about how the audience first experiences them. What are they doing, saying, feeling? What is their context when we first see them? Are they at peace or in turmoil? Are they at full emotional power or are they holding back for a burst of expression later? Most important is, what is the character doing at the moment of entrance? The character's first action is a wonderful opportunity to speak volumes about his attitude, emotional state, background, strengths and problems. The first action should be a model of the hero's characteristic attitude and the future problems or solutions that will result. The first behaviour we see should be characteristic. It should define and reveal character, unless your intent is to mislead the audience and conceal the character's true nature. There's a reference to the character of Svengali from the novel Trilby. Uh, my friend Dave has written a musical based on Svengali, so I enjoyed that. Alright, another Star Wars point. The cantina sequence in Star Wars sets up a conflict with the villain Jabba the Hutt which culminates in The Empire Strikes Back. No, it doesn't. It culminates in Return of the Jedi. Fuck's sake. Uh, this idea of near-death experiences as well, he says, anyone who has survived a true near-death experience, a sudden close call in a car or a plane, knows that for a while afterward, colours seem sharper, family and friends are more important, and time is more precious. The nearness of death makes life more real. So that is true, and we should all kind of live every day as if it was our last, because we never know what's going to happen. Before the supreme ordeal section of Star Wars is over, Luke witnesses the physical death of his mentor, Obi-Wan, in a laser duel with the villain Darth Vader. It was a fucking lightsaber duel, not a laser duel! 
To a shaman like Obi-Wan, death is a familiar threshold that can be crossed back and forth with relative ease. Obi-Wan lives within Luke and the audience through his teachings. Despite physical, tr despite physical death, he is able to give Luke crucial advice at later points in the story. Trust the Force, Luke. It's fucking use the Force, Luke, and he's used direct quotation marks to imply that's the line, and that's not the line. Okay, something here that I uh, picked this up actually from reading True Crime. The old English word for a ball of thread is a clue, spelled C-L-E-W. That's where we get our word clue. A clue is a thread that a seeker traces back to a centre, looking for answers or order. The skeins of thread that connect one heart to another may be the vital clue that solves a mystery or resolves a conflict. Um, and here he's talking about like showing, not telling, which is a very old writing tip, but you know, very relevant. He says, the trick for writers is to show the change in their characters, in behaviour or appearance, rather than by just talking about it. Writers must find ways to demonstrate that their heroes have been through a resurrection. So here's a nice little interesting bit about Latin. Sacrifice comes from Latin words meaning making holy. Heroes are often required to sanctify a story by making a sacrifice, perhaps by giving up or giving back something of themselves. Sometimes the sacrifice is the death of members of the group. Luke Skywalker at the climax of Star Wars sees many of his comrades killed in the effort to destroy the Death Star, all one word. Luke also gives up part of his personality, his dependence on machines. With Obi-Wan's voice in his head, he decides to trust the Force and learns to trust human instinct rather than machinery. No, he uses the Force! She Use the force, Luke! God damn, fucking Jesus Christ. Okay, and a little bit about denouement, um, uh, which I find interesting, because I, I knew this already just because I'd, I'm interested in French and storytelling, so they kind, of, they kind of come together here, but. Another name for the return is denouement, a French word meaning untying or unknotting. New means not. A story is like a weaving in which the lives of the characters are interwoven into a coherent design. The plot lines are knotted together to create conflict and tension, and usually it's desirable to release the tension and resolve the conflicts of by untying these knots. We also speak of tying up the loose ends of a story in a denouement. Whether tying up or untying, these phrases point to the idea that a story is a weaving and that it must be finished properly or it will seem tangled or ragged. That's why it's important in the return to deal with subplots and all the issues and questions you've raised in the story. It's all right for a return to raise new questions. In fact, that may be highly desirable, but all the old questions should be addressed or at least restated. Usually writers strive to create a feeling of closing the circle on all these storylines and themes. I like this idea, although again, he does question mark as one word, which is weird, but he says, a story like a sentence can end in only four ways, with a period, an exclamation point, a question mark, or an ellipsis. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. So we've got this little section called Caveat Scriptor, Let the Writer Beware. The hero's journey model is a guideline. It's not a cookbook recipe or a mathematical formula to be applied rigidly to every story. To be effective, a story doesn't have to concur with this or any other school, paradigm or method of analysis. The ultimate measure of a story's success or excellence is not its compliance with any established patterns, but its lasting popularity and effect on the audience. To force a story to conform to a structural model is putting the cart before the horse. It's possible to write good stories that don't exhibit every feature of the hero's journey. In fact, it's better if they don't. People love to see familiar conventions and expectations defied creatively. A story can break all the rules and yet still touch universal human emotions. So it's kind of one of those where you need to know the rules before you can break them, I guess. Uh, and then at the end, there's a section where he um, looks at how the, um, the journey relates to a few well-known movies. Let's see if we've got the list here. The Last of the Mohicans, Death Becomes Her, Pulp Fiction and Four Weddings and a Funeral. The Pulp Fiction one was quite interesting because obviously that doesn't actually follow like uh, a linear time frame or whatever, but it still kind of could tie into this. But yeah, overall, I mean, it did feel a bit as though he was trying to shoehorn these like successful things into his own model, um, which wasn't the best. And again, just this irritating thing of him apparently having never seen Star Wars or having totally forgotten it by the time we went to write about it because he just kept on getting it wrong which kind of annoyed me. Uh, overall, I gave it like a three out of five. It was okay. Um, there were like spelling mistakes and some weird layout things and this and that, which kind of marked it as a little bit below average for a you know traditionally well-published novel. Um, and also, I still just think you're probably better off just reading Joseph Campbell's stuff. Um, having said that, I mean, for me, this wasn't that useful because I already know all of the concepts in it. Um, but if you're a starting out writer, and especially if you're planning to be a screenwriter, it might be useful. But even then, because of how old it is, a lot of the examples will just be films you've never seen. So yeah, it was all right. I would recommend it if you are into writing. Otherwise, probably don't bother. The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler. 
So there we have it, that's what I made of The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.